The heat of the forge beat upon the giant blacksmith's grim face as his hammer rang on steel. Do you believe in myths, Quill? The blacksmith's servant boy asked, looking up from pumping the bellows. (laughs) Right now you're hearing the voice of Rain Wilson, actor, comedian, and longtime fan of science fiction and fantasy. He's reading to us from a manuscript he wrote in the eighth grade. A fantasy adventure called, you'll never guess, Sword of the Usurper. Lucky for us, he had it nearby so we could take a look. Look at my name. Rain. (laughs) Oh, Rain. R-A-Y-N-N. R-A-Y-N-N. I gave myself a pen name. So (laughs) They'll never know. (laughs) Rain is known as a comedic actor. You probably know him from playing Dwight Schrute on The Office. He's not known as a serious writer. The reason for that may be, well, have a listen. The man stood straight, wiped the sweat from his eyes, and put the red-hot piece of metal back into the glowing furnace to reheat. It depends on the myth, I suppose, he replied in a deep voice. Oh, it depends on the myth, I suppose. (laughs) What about that legend where the usurper will come in the night with a huge glowing sword and a band of sturdy followers and kill the tyrannical king, freeing the people of Gyra Chull? (laughs) Uh, Okay, I love Guy Retro. (laughs) Granted, this manuscript is written by a younger, much less experienced Rain. But it reveals something about the troubles of writing fantasy or sci-fi. When you create a world that looks so different from our own, it's very hard to keep it from sounding a little bit silly. Rain isn't the only one who struggled with that. My dad wrote science fiction. Oh, wow. He he has a book uh, published called Tentacles of Dawn. The cover of the book is a man punching a giant bat (laughs) with a very buxom woman hiding behind him. I mean, a a ridiculous... There's no tentacles. Maddie, Mark, and I are doing our best to write a serious story set in a science fiction world. Do we know what we're doing? Well, no, not, not really. We're all writers, but we've pretty much only ever written comedy. What we're aiming for is something like Dune or Star Trek. Something that takes itself seriously and gets away with it. What we're not aiming for is a comedy. Something that uses science fiction as a framework on which to hang a bunch of jokes. Something like Spaceballs. Yes, sir. Prepare ship for light speed. No, no, no. Light speed is too slow. Light speed too slow? Yes. We're going to have to go right to ludicrous speed. (gasps) And there's another kind of comedy associated with sci-fi. The kind that tries to take itself seriously, just like we're doing, but fails so miserably that audiences can't help but laugh at it. The kind of movie people watch ironically. Think the 2000 John Travolta epic, Battlefield Earth. While you were still learning how to spell your name, I was being trained to conquer galaxies. That's not what we're going for. But at this stage in the process, as we're finally getting around to actually writing the pilot, we're finding that comedy is creeping in. If we ever want our pilot to be taken seriously and succeed, we're going to have to turn down the comedy and write something truly earnest. But how? It's Let's Make a Sci-Fi, the show where three comedians try their absolute best to write a legit science fiction pilot. We're now a month and a half into writing our earnest science fiction TV series. A quick refresher on what takes place. Kirby, a low-level worker aboard a generational spaceship, one that is believed to house the last humans in the universe stumbles upon a transmission sent from a second spaceship that's been sent to stop them. We've been calling our two ships Ship A and Ship B, but we decided it was time to give them proper names. Ship B's came pretty easily. I feel like Ship A would have like a kind of fun, exciting, evocative name, and Ship B would be more like... A three the cruiser B, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, cruiser seven, totally. yeah. It might just have a bit more of a. I like cruiser seven. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so do I. Like, I, I. I'm down to lock in cruiser yeah. seven. Cruiser seven. It's cruiser seven. 
But for ship A, we wanted something bigger, something maybe a little more poetic. I was thinking about what's important on ship A, like, you know, their destiny, their their future, mm-hmm. their mission, mm-hmm. and like how they have to have babies. And I was thinking they ca- we call it Destiny's Child. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they don't, don't know. know they don't know what that was on earth. <laughs> Interesting. Ooh, what about progeny? <laughs> Proge- the progeny is not bad. What does progeny mean? Is it like your progeny, Offspring. like your kids are your progeny? I like progeny. I like linking it to generations, yeah. linking it to uh yeah. progeny's child. <laughs> <laughs> Destiny's progeny. <laughs> so ship A is progeny, ship B is cruiser 7. And that was kind of the last detail to iron out before we wrote the show. The goal of this podcast is to follow three comedians as we write a sci-fi pilot. But we're now many weeks into the project and we haven't actually written anything. That isn't to say we haven't been working. We've been building the world, creating characters and backstory, plotting out the season, plotting out the pilot, all of it without ever opening our screenwriting software. Way back in episode one of this podcast, we asked writer and director Jem Gerrard for some advice. And they told us what they read in Stephen King's book on writing. His advice was really to to just write as as, as simple as that sounds, even if you don't feel like it. Whatever you're feeling, just write and get that first draft out the way, no matter how crap it is. So we are now, after many months, finally writing the first draft. But how? Well, for the first time in this process, we're going to split up. We're going to each take a different part of the pilot, go home, and write our scenes all alone. I kind of want to do ship B, and at their their border, at their wit's end. I can do the teaser, and then I'll do scene four. Now, this is kind of a transformative moment for us. We're splitting up, and when we come back together, we're going to have a first draft. It kind of feels like like the end of like seventh grade, you're so excited, but then the next... Like after summer, you're in eighth grade and you're like, oh, shit, <laughs> like this is harder. <laughs> but it's <laughs> but it is exciting. <laughs> we all took our parts home and wrote. And to catch you up, some of the details we discussed earlier in the series have changed. Like, you know, those twin brothers that inadvertently created alcohol. Yeah, they're gone. Also, we decided the crew aboard Cruiser 7 is accompanied by a robot a goat-shaped cyborg named CREA-M. It's an acronym. It stands for... uh, Well, we haven't decided yet. When we were finished our homework, we met up one week later to discuss. It was scary writing it, and I've never written anything. I was literally typing it, and I was like, is that what you do? You just write it without jokes? Is just what you think is going to (laughs) happen? Like, I don't get it. Like, I literally don't get it. Like, my thing was just that, like... I know we're going to change everything. So I wasn't like making it super good. Because I couldn't. <laughs> yeah. And then we sat down and read through our first draft. All right. Are we ready? Yes. As ready as I'll ever be. Here we are. Interior. Asteroid mines. Tunnel 3. We open in complete silence inside a dimly lit cave tunnel with curved, smooth walls. Strobe-like flashes of blue and red light up the cave like a dance floor as white-hot laser cutters slice into the cold interior. This is where our characters and world started to really come to life. I need a key printed. Door 242B. This is the item number. She hands a slip to Houston. Put that shit away. He pushes her hand down and glances towards the door. Do you think I can just input an order into the machine, print it up, and hand it back to you? Yeah, I know you can. I used to run this thing. That's exactly how it works. Well, not anymore. We got to meet some of the faces you'll come to love. And possibly hate? Pug lays a silver tray with a water carafe on her bedside table. He looks at her affectionately. Bo walks in. I hope there's a reason you have that self-satisfied smirk on your face. Candle ceremony, Father, puts everyone in a good mood. I really like Lee, Pug, and Bo. I really like that Bo is a redhead with a black mustache yeah. who's described as super <laughs> hot yeah. and ripped with perfect teeth. Yeah, yeah. Hard to find that actor, but yeah. <laughs> and we got a sense of the power dynamics on the ships. Herbie and Washington speak in hushed tones inside of a tiny room, barely big enough to fit both of them inside. I don't understand. Neither did I, but 
They said there's ships everywhere with other people on them. No, I, I don't understand. I told you to go get a part for that light. I didn't tell you to fuss with the communication machinery that you don't understand. Washington, this changes everything. The Washington and Kirby relationship in that, I felt like real stakes. The whole thing held together pretty well, considering. I mean, there are some logistics we still need to figure out. I feel like every scene is right before everyone goes to bed, and then it's like again at night, and That's then it's the next point. day. You know, I, I know that yeah, I've yeah. I've been willy nilly about that too, and I know I've been. Oh no! In my own time. act, everyone goes to bed three times. It's like a, it's like <laughs> <laughs> every hey, scene is like the last night. scene before bed. <laughs> good night. Good night. But for the most part, we felt really good about the first draft the whole way through. Yeah. Woo-hoo! I love Dr. Air. Dr. Dr. Air. Air cool. Maybe it's not so hard to write a show with no laughs. <laughs> you know, but he's scary. Oh, yeah. I like Dr. Eric when he has those one word responses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Very powerful. I mean, this is really invigorating. I feel so excited about the show right now. Yeah, me cool. too. Me too. Good job, team. Thank you for your work. So now we have a script and we're ready to show it to someone in the industry. This is where Rain Wilson comes in. He's already shown us his fantasy fan badge with Sword of the Usurper, but his experience with imagined worlds doesn't end there. I was fortunate. One of the very first movies I ever did, in fact, maybe the first movie I ever did, was Galaxy Quest. Um, One of the great comedies of all time and one of the great science fiction movies of all time. Sir. I am Lank, Senior Requisition Officer. Before we travel to the ship, please let me know if you have any requirements. Weapons, documents, personnel? Um, uh, Coca-Cola, do you have one of those? Rain has had an entire career since that fateful casting. Among the notable credits on his resume, he's played a billionaire with a vendetta against giant sharks in The Meg. That was a serious man versus nature moment. And he helped revive Star Trek's beloved original series con artist, Harry Mudd, for the Discovery era. Welcome, kiddies. Make yourselves at home. I have. How the hell did you get out of that prison, Mud? Uh, you remember my multi-legged friend, Stuart. Well, if we performed a feat of magic that would make the most accomplished escape artist blush. With all of the times Rain has played comic relief roles in science fiction and sci-fi adjacent projects, you'd be surprised to learn his formal training originally had nothing to do with playing the funny guy. My training comes from the theater where it's kind of like, okay... What's the story you're telling? Who's the character you're playing? And then kind of what world are you in? And uh, what's the style of the world you, you, that you're in? And ready, go. So um, I don't think that there is like, that's why I think so many great comedy actors are great dramatic actors, uh, ultimately, because it's, it's just about storytelling. So with his expertise in both comedy and drama, we're sure that Rain could sniff out any unintended comedy in our pilot. He graciously agreed to read a scene with us. He took on the role of gruff Captain Donovan aboard Cruiser 7. Okay, so here we are. Interior Cruiser 7 Commissary Night. For non-blue humans, so that has to do with another part of the script. For non-blue humans sit around a card table bouncing dehydrated peas into an upturned toothpaste cap in the middle of the table. This ship looks different than the one we've been on all episode. A grizzled bald man with suspenders and a pinstripe space shirt, Donovan, gets a dehydrated pea into the toothpaste cup. Number two exclaims excitedly. Nice one, sir. I can't take this anymore. He turns over the card table. Peas go everywhere. My lunch. My lunch. This whole (laughs) ship is my lunch. And I'm sitting here with my lunch on my lap because you people can't make contact with a ship that's two space inches away from our noses. It's more than two space inches, sir. Don't be a literalist, number two. A civilization as far removed as theirs may have customs we can only dream of. They may not speak the language they left Earth speaking. They could have three heads. We don't know. I don't care if they have four heads. I need one of those heads to start talking to me. We put out our initial message a week ago. We can't just wait around. Well, what the hell else are we supposed to do, number two? I was agreeing with you, sir. The chief ignores her. Where's Tom? Behind them, a young hot guy with shaggy hair and a laid-back attitude tries to duck out of view before anyone notices him. He's right there, sir. The captain spins around with purpose to see Tom. Tom, why the hell have they not gotten our message? Huh? How long does a damn radio take to transmit something? It's instant, sir, if we're in range. Well, are we in 
range? I don't know. You don't know? It, if it was in range, I, I, don't, I don't see why they wouldn't answer. Well, there's a lot of possibilities, maybe in their culture. I don't need your maybes. I need answers. Hey, don't yell at me. Ah, uh, come on. Uh, they all start arguing. Tom throws right. some frozen peas at the captain. Uh, if they've been able to see our message and send us back, this light would be blinking. It's not blinking, is it? It is blinking. Tom, it is blinking. <laughs> Tom looks down <laughs> at it in surprise. Everyone registers this at the exact same time and starts freaking out. Oh, oh my no. God, what does this mean? It means that there's somehow... Everyone shut up. He presses the blinking light. Hello? Is this a joke? <laughs> <laughs> the captain smiles a tiny but triumphant smile. We have liftoff. Good job, everyone. Really good scene. Really good read. Initial thoughts, Rain? Um, <laughs> well, um, it's is it supposed to be funny that he keeps calling her number two? Yeah, so that stood out a lot to <laughs> yeah. me, hearing it out loud. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. This draft may be veering a little closer to comedy than we hoped. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely felt like, oh, this is a comedy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It definitely felt like this is comedic dialogue. On our first read-through with an outside force, we've already been flagged for sticking humor where it doesn't belong. Well, maybe it's just Cruiser 7. Or maybe we were so enamored with our first draft that we turned a blind eye to other unintentional humor. Let's rewind to that first read-through we did together. Worker 2 grabs the yellow tape and moves it out of Kirby's path. Kirby continues to take readings off the pipe as she moves into the off-limits area. I'm going to need to deal with this right now. Why don't you jostle... You didn't jostle these pipes, did you? No, no, no. We didn't touch them, I swear. <laughs> with one hand, Kirby grabs a small mallet out of her bag and begins to lightly smack the pipe above her. She smacks the pipe a couple more times. The workers stare up at the hammer, slightly confused. Is that... Is that how you fix that? <laughs> oh, yeah. These pipes need to be told who's boss. Interior, nursery, night. Lee and Pug are walking around to all the babies in the nursery, <laughs> anointing their little foreheads with a chalky white oil. Outside, there are dozens of people looking through the window as this, at this ritual in awe. Beneath their smiles, Lee and Pug are having a tense conversation. Where is Bo? Lee picks up a crying baby and rocks it soothingly. He was supposed to be here. Some people can read lips, dear. <laughs> she smiles at the crowd and holds the baby up like the Lion King. <laughs> okay, so maybe I was wrong. Turns out there are a lot of laughs in our supposedly earnest sci-fi series. I love the baby ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> the Lion King. <laughs> Don't you know what Another doing baby, baby <laughs> anointed for our ship. Yeah. <laughs> this is cause for concern. The whole premise of this podcast is three comedians writing an earnest sci-fi pilot. Not a spoof, not a parody. That's supposed to be the challenge. And from day one, we've been super sensitive to this. We've had our antennas up to detect the tiniest iota of comedy and snuff it out throughout this whole process. The words... That's too funny. Kept coming up. From when we were pitching ideas? Red Rover, so are, that, are we thinking that's too funny? Do we ruminate on that? To when we designed the ship? Maybe a kitchen? Is a kitchen too funny? I work in yeah, the kitchen. Yeah, like... <laughs> no, kitchen's like quite funny. Imagining a chef and his guys. Yeah, like, and... I gotta go to my shift at the kitchen. To when we were naming characters. Narch. Narch I like. Narch. Narch is, Narch is too funny. But I keep going back to something Neil Blomkamp said earlier in our writing process. The best result that you may get could be a science fiction comedy combination. You know, you may be shooting yourself in the foot to make it earnest. I know that's the whole point. Maybe Neil was right. Maybe we are shooting ourselves in the foot. I know I've made a big stink for this whole podcast about writing something serious... But should we be fighting so hard against our natural inclination? We know we want to make something that's closer to Star Wars than Spaceballs. But when you think about it, there's plenty of wiggle room there. Maybe there's a happy medium where we can have a serious show with comedy moments. After all, comedy is part of the human experience. And really, do we want to make a serious show or do we want to make a human show? 
There are tons of examples of dramatic works with funny moments that don't take away from the realness of the show. I mean, think about Mad Men. It's a drama about Don Draper, one of the moodiest characters in TV history, but it's also about his boss, Roger Sterling, and his endless supply of quips. She died like she lived, surrounded by the people she answered phones for. Or Goodfellas. I mean, people are murdering each other left and right, but the tone is so real that moments like this don't feel out of place. Look at this. Ah, it's beautiful. I like this one. The dog, one dog goes one way and the other dog goes the other way. One is going east and the other one is going west. So what? And this guy's saying, what do you want from me? The guy's got a nice head of white hair. Look how beautiful with the dog. It looks the same. They, they... Looks like somebody we know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's bring Rain Wilson back into the mix. He knows that a little bit of levity can go a long way in sci-fi. Case in point, Rain's rendition of Harry Mudd for Star Trek Discovery. You know, I think Star Trek Discovery uh, is a very serious show. Maybe one could say it's too serious, like kind of lighten up, folks. Um, <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> but uh, it was uh, a conscious choice to have Harry Mudd and someone like me play Harry Mudd to brighten things up a little bit. But right. to do it not through shifting the tone of the show... Because do you remember back in the original Star Trek, there were there were some episodes of Star Trek, like the Trouble with Tribbles, mm-hmm, for instance, yeah. where it's, it's almost like a comedy. Mm-hmm. Jim, I think I've got it. All we have to do is quit feeding them. We quit feeding them, they stop breeding. Now he tells me. They would have, they would shift literally the tone of the episode. So they would have right. like the comedic episode. Mm-hmm. And then it would get back into the serious kind of Wrath of Khan type of episodes, which I think we all like better. But mm. what Discovery did was just, we're going to bring in the occasional characters that bring in some levity uh, to the show. And that's the role that Harry Mudd played. So he's quick-witted, he's mercurial, and he's not afraid to tell a joke, but he's also kind of dastardly. Do we want to shift gears and give in to our inclinations and write a comedy sci-fi? I mean, that wouldn't necessarily be a walk in the park either. Yeah, comedy and science fiction is tough. There have been very few sci-fi... It's kind of like horror. There are very few comedy horror movies. like Shaun of the Dead and, like, you know, American Werewolf in London. And I think that's one thing that Star Wars did very well, especially those first three, is they brought, you know, Han Solo. And they they weren't afraid to just go for, like, okay, we're going to have a laugh right now. Yeah. Jedi. Three PO. You tell that slimy piece of worm-ridden filth to get no such pleasure from us, right? It's very tricky stuff. How's how's that going? With, are you <laughs> trying to inject comedy into your movie? No, it, it's sort of the opposite. It's more like I just if I like it, it's funny. You know what I mean? Like I'm like, oh, there's something there that's making me happy about it, and it's usually because I think it's kind of funny. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, we mm-hmm. find that a lot of yeah. times we say like. When we agree on a, an idea that's good, we, yeah. we, we catch ourselves going like, oh, that's funny. Yeah. Oh, that's, <laughs> oh, that's funny. funny. Put that in. <laughs> so when we're deciding between writing a comedy sci-fi or something earnest, is it really one or the other? With a concept like that, it sounds like you really want it to be like 85% kind of serious sci-fi, but you just need to have that 15% kind of magic sprinkle dust yeah. Yeah. of like some wryness and abs- a little bit of absurdity and maybe some characters that are on, on a little bit more on the comedic spectrum than the yeah. central characters, but uh, too much. And it's just kind of goofy land. Yeah. So I think it's got to work as sci-fi first and foremost, and then you can have a little mm-hmm. special sauce of comedy, but sometimes if it's really grounded and s- feels super real, when you bring in a little bit of comedy, a little goes a long way, and it can right. be especially funny, and it can really land effectively. After our frank discussion with Rain, we got together to go over our script one more time with a more critical eye. There's a lot of comedy in there too. <laughs> There's, a lot There's of so funny many stuff. funny things. But like some of it can stay, some of it can't. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like some, yeah. of it, some of it is funny because it's like, oh, this is a different culture or this is sort of, you know, like, mm-hmm. but there are some righteous jokes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to keep those because also like that's the stakes for you caring about those people, you yeah. know? Yeah. 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 I like jokes. Yeah. Yes. Everybody likes jokes and everybody cares about a funny character. 
But like Rain said, the jokes need to have purpose. Too many jokes, and your dialogue becomes less dynamic, more comedic. Too much, and it's just kind of goofy land. So what parts of our storyline can handle the comedy without losing the atmosphere we're going for? I, fi- I think I figured it out. It's like, if you're employing a cliché in order to be funny, that's why it feels like a sketch, because it feels like a sketch of, like, yeah. a gruff captain. You know what I mean? It's yeah. not that the patter is comedic. It's that you're employing, like, some sort of cliché. That's what takes you out of the world. Like, and you have to be careful with your comedy. I think we're saying the same thing, because you want your audience to buy into the yeah. fact that they're watching yeah. this fantastical thing. Good point, Ryan. Let's put this theory to use on ship B. Specifically, the scene we read with Rain. What stays and what gets left on the cutting room floor? So I wrote this one first draft. And I've been very married to the fact that ship B would be way funnier than the other ship. And they'd be kind of like this. And I I was very attached to that. And I think reading it this way, I'm like, it doesn't, it actually doesn't add to the show for them to be funny. That's one scene we need to de-sketchify. Now for the rest of the pilot. Yes, we giggled as we read it aloud to each other, but does the story come off as a spoof like Shippy's bumbling crew members do? The story is a story. We didn't make a spoof in terms of like, we have like an original story. If the story is really there and we don't feel like mm. we've done like a shitty parody annoying yeah. thing, that seems like a tone that would make sense for us. And for you to listen to this whole podcast and then listen to that at the end would be like, cool. As long as it can still earn pathos, you know, like it still yeah. has to be able to earn like, um, mm. and so like too much, too much of that can like deflate from, uh, I, I think, think from, yeah, we don't stakes. deflate the stakes. I think we just need to think about tone um, mm-hmm. in terms of uh, where does a humor come from? So now we move forward with an even clearer view of our sci-fi pilot. Do we still want to try for a serious story? Yes, Absolutely. We just need to keep an eye on the overall tone. Let the funny moments be funny and hope the serious moments aren't. And what we have right now doesn't need to be scrapped entirely, just fine-tuned to make sure each nugget of funny rings true in an otherwise serious adventure. We're getting very close to the end here, folks. In a couple of episodes, we're going to be reading the finished pilot with a full cast of actors. But now it's time to write the second draft of our pilot. Once again, we go our separate ways to tweak the different acts of our script. And on the next episode, we'll send our new, more earnest draft off for notes to a network executive. I think there was quite a lot of dialogue about things that I didn't quite understand yet. Let me just remember some specifics. You'll hear that next time on Let's Make a Sci-Fi. Let's Make a Sci-Fi is hosted by Maddie Kelly, Mark Chavez, and Ryan Beal, and created by Kelly and Kelly with development from Ryan Beal. This episode is written and produced by Dave Shimka, Max Collins, and Chris Kelly. The coordinating producer is Lauren Berkovich. Jeff Turner is our senior producer, and Arif Nurani is the director of CBC Podcasts. Our theme song is by Chris Kelly. Special thanks to Rain Wilson. Page one, interior. A woman cries out in labor. I didn't want this. I never did. Baby comes out. Alien baby. I need water to breathe. I'm an Aquan. We put the baby in water. <laughs> the baby then, knows the title it's an screen, Aquan. Title screen. Title screen. No, 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 no. Stop. The baby what? knows it's an Aquan already. Like, yes. how does the and baby is talking. And is talking. And knows it's My, called his an first words. <laughs> 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 Title screen, awkward. <laughs> <laughs>